<laughs> so we're behind 56 to 6. <laughs> now we're going to go for two. <laughs> right. We're going for two, right. right. I mean, that's how bad it was. Beyond the halls of government and some of the greatest museums in the world, Washington is home to another national treasure from the world of sports. Today, we continue our conversation with legendary sportscaster Johnny Holiday, who traded in his spurs as America's number one disc jockey to become a sports legend, whose reassuring voice powered the imagination and moved the heart of generations of sports fans. I'm one of them. From Ballard Studios in Washington, D.C., it's 13th and Park. The future doesn't belong to the faint party. There is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. We will make America strong again. We will get through this together. I can hear you. The rest of the world hears you. And the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Well, Johnny, now we're going to talk about sports a little bit. And I want to do the same thing when we talked about music. You alluded to the fact that when you were at high school in North Miami High, you were a sportsman. You set some records oh, yeah. there at the school. <laughs> okay, you're a record holder for a short period of yeah. time. So tell us about that. What were your favorite sports? What sports did you like to play? And what sports continued on, if any, after you graduated high school? Interesting. In those days... Most of the guys were my size. <laughs> there was no, I mean, our fullback was like six feet, 190 pounds, okay? The guards in football were 165 pounds. <laughs> I mean, they were all like small guys. Yeah. And we'd all gone to school together from junior high school. We get to Constance. They formed this first football team. And we all go out. And we had, I mean, it was like a Bad News Bears team. <laughs> we had University of Miami hand-me-down uniforms. Wow that you'd put the jersey on over the helmet, over the shoulder pads, and then pull it up, and then it would it would detach down. I mean, it was, and high tops. And when you look at a guy like 5'8", 126 pounds, trying to run in high tops, and your ankles are going like, you know, it was just, nothing worked. I mean, it was so bad. And we scored one touchdown <laughs> the entire year. One touchdown. What? Yeah, that was it. Oh, wow. And I threw a pass on my birthday. Uh, on a rainy day against Tech High School, to the right corner of the end zone for Joe Gomez. The wind catches it, blows it to the left corner, and Joe Rojas catches it. <laughs> touchdown. <laughs> and we're behind 56 to 6. <laughs> now we're going to go for two. <laughs> right. We're going for two, right. right. I mean, that's how bad it was. <laughs> and in baseball, uh, I started the first game, had the first no hitter. And, but we had a really good baseball team. And then basketball, we got to the state tournament in basketball. And I just, I love playing sports. So you played all three sports, baseball, oh, football, football, baseball, and basketball. And my size, yeah. 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 Uh, and enjoyed it. Probably could have focused more on academics, but all the guys that played sports, and I think it's, it's partially due to the fact that the teachers liked us. Mm-hmm. And they gave all the sports guys breaks, okay? Mm-hmm. Where none of us were Phi Beta Kappas as far as academics were concerned. Mm-hmm. And I think going back, I kind of wish they would have done things things a little bit different, made it tougher on us. But they looked the other way. You got, you got a game to, we'll, we'll make that up later on. And never did. Right. You know, so it was great time, though. Great time. Your list of credits reads like a sports almanac play-by-play announcer for the Washington Nationals, Baltimore Orioles, Winter and Summer Olympics, the Masters, which I didn't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I read up on you. I've, I've learned things about you before the You've summer. read the book. I read the book. But I know that, you know, maybe your love of, of all is the 40-plus years you spent as the play-by-play for the University of Maryland Terps, basketball in particular. I was going to ask you your favorite of all those, but I, I kind of know where that goes. Yeah. Yeah. What is it about the Terps? And about that connection, that even to this day, kind of you get up and you're kind of excited to take on the next contest. I think working for one school is a major, major advantage for broadcasters. I've had chances in the past to go to networks. And I've also done games where I fly in on a Friday and do a game on Friday night and fly back home on Saturday of two teams that I have no interest in and don't know a thing about. And that's pretty tough to do. 
But when you're working with one school, as long as I have, this will be my 45th year Mm. coming up, football and basketball. And you get to know the kids. You get to know the administration. You get to know the coaches. You get to know the families of the kids that play. Uh, And you become part, you're part of the whole football program, the whole basketball program. You're emceeing all the banquets that they have. Mm. You're doing all the commercials for the University of Maryland. You're doing the narrations. You're doing everything. You can't beat that. When I started off in 1979, Lefty was the head coach in basketball. Okay, we should say for the record, Lefty Lefty Drizel. Lefty Drizel. That would be a quick, anyone under 30, that would be a tough one. Yeah, that's That's right. right. Yes. And Jerry was the football coach, (laughs) Claiborne. Claiborne. (laughs) Okay. And you look at all the games that I've done, and you mentioned you know what the favorite is in basketball, the national championship, but this may be right here. May the record and reflect that he's pointing to his ring. Yes, yes. Okay. national championship yes. ring. Yes. national championship ring. University of Maryland. Yes. And then football, the, the bowl games you go to, and I've got so many great little stories, like Boomer Esiason. A story about him people don't even have never heard, maybe, is the first day he came to practice, came down from Long Island, and he was a hot shot high school football, football player. And he had made a comment somewhere about I'm, gonna, I'm the guy that can save the program and take the program to the next level. So I'm doing this radio interview. I said, what makes you think that you're going to save this program? So Boomer, bless his heart, says, well, number one, uh, you got to be exciting, and I'm exciting, okay? <laughs> number two, your quarterback has got to be a winner. I'm a winner. Right. Yeah. Every, he went along. He said, that's why we're going to improve this program. Next question. <laughs> and to this day, he remembers that. Asked and answered, yeah, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. So, you know, uh, there are a lot of moments, obviously, in your experience with the Terps, that, and I can imagine all the things you went through. Obviously, the championship season oh. speaks for itself. But there is also, I remember growing up and was mesmerized by Len Bias. Yeah. This incredible power forward that just took over when he was on the court. And I remember seeing you say, because I didn't know this, that when he went up and he went up many times against Michael Jordan, he outscored Michael Jordan. Yeah. And then, of course, he passed away like this. Of all the sports you had ever seen, all the athletes you've spoken with and you've interviewed, did that have a real kind of lasting impact on you? It certainly did on the audience. When I was working the morning at WMAL doing sports, and I got a call from a guy at Leland Hospital, and he said to me, Mr. Holliday, I I think they just brought Lynn Bias in with a heart attack. So I called my boss, and he said, okay, get in the car, go right out to the hospital. So I'm driving out. And he passed away. Then they told me, don't go to the hospital, go to the University of Maryland. I walked in the school and down the hallway, here comes the chancellor. Here comes the athletic director. Here comes Lefty. I mean, they're all coming down the hallway with just the shock, blank look on their faces. And you could have heard a pin drop. And I'm thinking to myself, this can't be, that he could not have had an overdose, not Len Bias. No way. No, because he, he was a specimen. Not only could he score, he could jump out of, a, of an arena. Right. He was that good. Yeah. That good. And then the tough thing was his mom calls me and says, Len would want you to be the vocalist at his funeral. Can you sing? I said, Mrs. Bias, I can't, I can't do it. Can't do it. And she said, you sing in theater, don't you? I said, yeah, that's different. She says, please, for Lynn. I'm going home, Mike. <laughs> wow. So I was up in the loft at the uh, Memorial Chapel, and I got through the Lord's Prayer. Toughest thing I've ever, ever had to do. And... Uh, when, you, when you're singing that song, you think about you think about a lot of things just to get you through the song. Right. And I got through it and then started crying my eyes out. Mm. And as I looked down, Mrs. Bias is walking behind the casket, and she goes, ah. and that, that was it for me. Toughest thing I ever had to do. And he was such, 
He, he was such a nice kid. I was there when he signed to come to Maryland at Northwestern High School. Wow. Uh, he would always be available for interviews. Never, he never big timed anybody. And just a tragedy. But as his mother says, his death has maybe prevented other kids yeah. from experimenting one time with drugs. Right. And she says, look at my son, the great athlete he was. And cocaine or any other drugs does not seek out just because you're this or that. Anybody can take it and boom, you're gone. Yeah, that was a tragedy. I remember at the time, shocking. And as a fan of the sport of basketball, we we, we missed out. Look what it did. Look what it did to the program too. Yeah. I mean, it set the it, the program just came to a screeching halt for years. Yeah. It took to get back to normal. So. I'm going to ask a similar question to what I asked before because I'm so curious. Uh, not many people have a chance to experience all the sporting events that you've experienced in your life. I've seen a fraction of those. I could probably list a few that I experienced. I was at the World Series game with the Marlins in 1997. Wow. And the seventh game, when it went into extra innings in the seventh game of the World Series, I was there. That was an amazing experience. And the 2013 NBA Finals, Ray Allen hits a three-point shot with five seconds left to tie the game to send it into overtime against the San Antonio Spurs when the yellow ropes were being pulled around the court because they were getting ready to hand the championship trophy to the Spurs (laughs) because we were down three games to two in that series at that time. So what are the most memorable sporting events? Obviously, the Maryland National Championship, but uh, there might be some others that really stand out for you. Any Olympic Games that I went to (laughs) was a highlight of my career. The first one was Sarajevo. I was in the studio doing shows to an hour, and you're working all night over there because it's daytime here. I was doing women's figure skating with Carol Heist Jenkins, gold medalist from 1958 for the United States. And I said to my boss, first of all, I saw the assignment sheet. And I said, uh, you know, I grew up in Miami, <laughs> right. and I don't know a lot about figure skating. <laughs> and my boss says, Shelby Whitfield, bless his heart. He said, but you can do it, can't you? I said, well, yeah, get, get, the, get out of here, get out of here. <laughs> so I sit down with Carol Eistrick. I said, Carol, and this is a little inside story. I said, I don't know anything, nothing about <laughs> She said, okay. He has a yellow pad, draws a line down the middle. She said, Here's the con- here are the con- contestants' names over here. And our job was to do updates. Fred Manfred was in the studio, the former Orioles guy. He would throw it to us, and we could do an update of what was going on. And she says, I'm going to write onto the side of each name what I think are their strengths. Sal Chow, Triple Axel, blah, blah, blah. So when, when they throw it to you, <laughs> right. I'm going to be pointing. <laughs> to the bad. Yeah, that's, that, that's what happened. Now, this is ABC Radio, nationwide. Fred Manfred, let's go to Skandaria. With an update in women's figure skating, Johnny Holiday and Carol Ice Jenkins. Johnny, what's going on? Fred, thank you very much. Carol, you know, I really like the the possibility, she's pointing to Nancy Kerrigan, of Nancy Kerrigan uh, bringing home a gold medal for the United States, mainly because she's pointing triple axle. I love her triple axle. <laughs> Johnny, you know, you're exactly right. Her triple <laughs> axle. Is, back to you, Fred. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That was tremendous. Doing boxing in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Ken Norton Hmm. was the analyst, and I'm doing Olympic boxing. I did every one of Sugar Ray Leonard's championship fights on ABC radio. Every one. Wow. Wow. Tremendous. The USFL with Paul Horning, Hall of Famer, is my analyst. Mm -hmm. I did the Saturday night game of the week. Fred Manfred did the Monday night game of the week, and we both had, I had Paul Horning as my analyst. He had him on Monday. Great, great guy. Uh, Working with Rick Barry, one of the 50 best NBA players of all time. Right. Did his first college basketball with me. We did Cal basketball, the time Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was playing. Mm. So, and then there's one guy right now who works on the Golf Channel and NBC Sports, Terry Gannon, Mm -hmm. an analyst for golf. I did the ACC championship in baseball. I had never done play-by-play. First time, and I had two analysts. One game was Terry Gannon, Gannon, <laughs> okay. and Larry Conley. Okay, so Conley's a basketball player, and 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 Terry's a basketball player. 
And they were both tremendous, tremendous analysts. And they had never done it either. So the second game that I did was the Orioles at Cleveland. Mm. So I never did a minor league game. Wow. And not a, you just don't do that. Right. So when I, when I always use the word about lucky and right place, right time, perfect example right there. So let's talk about some of the great names in sports announcing, many of whom you knew and probably knew very well. Yeah. When you start going down the list, Howard Cosell, I think you actually interviewed Howard Cosell at one point. Howard Cosell. Howard Cosell. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dick Vitale. I mean, yeah, he's, he's incomparable, right? Yeah. But then I think about people like Johnny Miller. And as an Orioles fan from the past, uh, Chuck Thompson, who popularized, yes. of course. The, ain't the, the beer cold. Ain't the beer cold, right. <laughs> what is it about sports announcing? That gives you kind of that unique feel for the game and ability to communicate that to an audience. The guy that, that really turned me on to sports play-by-play was Frank Lieber, the play-by-play broadcaster for the Dallas Cowboys and for CBS. So when I was a disc jockey in Cleveland, he would call me up and say, uh, you know, we're coming to town to play the Browns. I got 25 bucks for you if you can spot for me. Yes, sir, Mr. Lieber, and I'm 20, 21, 22 years old. So the thing I liked about Frank Lieber was he was so low-key, so nice, so personable, and he'd say, he had his chart there, and he'd say, okay, Johnny, all I want you to do is, first time I ever spotted, he said, just point, you know, who makes the tackle. I'll take the ball carrier. You point out, makes the tackle. And uh, this is going to be fine, no problem at all. He gives him the money ahead of time, 25 bucks. So it comes time, they're getting close to airtime. And everybody's jumping around and all frazzled, but not Frank. The producer says, you got about 30 seconds, Frank. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so, Johnny, you got any questions at all? Just let me know. And, and, uh, <laughs> and we just go from there. But it's going to be fine. Just be sure and point out the, who makes the tackle and I got it. Uh, five seconds, Frank. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Boom. Hello, everybody. Frank Lieber from Cl- Boom. He goes right into his broadcasting voice right. back to Cleveland in just a minute. Okay, so Johnny, what I want you to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm th- and then I'm watching him do a game, and I'm saying he only gets excited when the game is exciting. I mean, mm-hmm. guys today Interesting. are over, up here. Right, all the they time. They start here, and they got nowhere to go. Right. Okay, right. where do you go from here? You're dead. You got to have some up and down, peaks and valleys. And And so I said to myself, boy, I love the way – he does a game. If I ever get a chance, I'm going to do Frank Lieber. Mm. And that's he was the one guy that was the most influential for me. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's remarkable. Well, back in the day, uh, Howard Cosell, John Madden was another oh, yeah. uh, announcer who kind of had his own little fame and became known as much as some of the players, if not more than some of the players. Mm. Of all the sports, you, you mentioned the Olympics. And obviously there's a lot of different sports in the Olympics, but which one do you really enjoy the most in terms of announcing? Is it baseball? Is it football, basketball? I hate to really... Is it like picking one of your children? I thought who's he was, your, your yeah, yeah, was going to go to figure skating. I'm, I'm already yeah. shocked. He's like... <laughs> I, would, I would probably say at the Olympics, Yeah, I would say covering the downhill was exciting and covering the, the Jamaican bobsled... There you go. If okay, you remember yeah. that, when they yeah. turned I over that, yeah. and they went down, that I went out to interview these guys, and they were they were tremendous. <laughs> Tre- I said, were you, were you guys afraid as you were overturned in this sled coming around? Uh, a little bit, yes. <laughs> a little, just a little bit afraid. But, you know, we had our helmets on, so we're going on the ice with our, <laughs> our helmets. Wow. Yeah, wow. That, that was great. We'll be back in a moment. 35 years ago, Jamaica did something few ever imagined. They entered the Calgary Winter Olympics with a four-man bobsled team. On their third run, one turn from the finish, the bobsled crashed, stunning a world audience. Not only did they walk away unscathed, but they also walked into the hearts of everyone, inspiring a very popular sports movie called Cool Runnings. Since Calgary, Jamaica has entered the Olympics bobsled competition six times. No medals yet, but memories galore. Now back to 13th and Park for more on Johnny Holiday in the world of sports. I think maybe the first the first one I did, Sarajevo was the first Olympics. Mm-hmm. 
And there's so many memories because ABC had the rights for radio and television, and they would bring all the people from TV there. And then Calgary, I'd ride the bus with Peter Jennings every morning. we take the bus, and every morning wow. Peter Jennings would say at 3 o'clock in the morning, Hey, Johnny, how many more days do we have to go with this? <laughs> uh, nine more. Jay, <laughs> nine more. <laughs> and then Sydney, Australia, because of the beauty of the city. Mm -hmm. Oh, And then Seoul, South Korea was incredible. Atlanta, when the, I mean, the bomb went off in Atlanta, and that scared everybody to pieces. And then the people you work with, too, all the people. Vital was there, and Lute Olson, the coach at uh, Arizona, Arizona, was there. As a, Jim Valvano mm -hmm. would come back no. in Los Angeles and sit down with us at the pool at night, mm -hmm. and we just listened to his stories, talking about uh, basketball and life general. Just great memories. You're part of history, and when I say that, <laughs> When I say that, what do you mean by that? <laughs> you're, you're not history, but you're a not part yet. of history, just to make the distinction. You are critical to the historical record when you think about it. When people want to relive, say, the Terps championship moment you know, against Indiana mm -hmm. or, the, or anything in sports or anything in music, go back to your, your four best friends you didn't get the picture with, the Beatles, you are part of this historical record, and people keep replaying that record. So... You may have done, you know, a game three weeks ago, and you'll think, well, I, hopefully I did well, you know, the team did well. Yeah. But somewhere downstream, it could be 20 years from now, someone's going to look back on that moment for whatever the reasons are, and the, the one who's going to interpret the moment for them is going to be you. I keep going back to the same cliche that I use all the time. It's, it's almost like what I've been able to do has been a dream come true, really. For a kid that grew up in Miami, he didn't have anything. I mean, we had nothing. For my dad to give me five bucks was a pretty big deal. And no college degree. Couldn't afford to get the degree. And not knowing what I wanted to do and to be able to wind up now in my 67th year in the business, having done a lot of different things that have all been self-taught. And if I, if I want to get, get anything out of what I've been able to do or fortunate to do, it's to be able to tell kids out there or young people who haven't got anything, and it's, it's a struggle. Hey, I've been there, okay? I know what you're going through. But I always knew that I could do anything. I knew I could do play-by-play. -play. I knew I could do theater. I knew I could take leading roles in shows. I knew I could do commercials. I knew I could do announcing for David Brinkley and Sam and Cokie and 2020 and PBS. I knew I could do television shows and host. I, I just I just had, it wasn't a cocky feeling. It was just a, I, I, I really can't put my finger on what it is that I've got. But for any young people that wants to do what I'm doing, if you really want it enough and believe you can do it, sky's the limit. If there's any reservations or any doubt, well, I'm not sure, forget it. Mm -hmm. You're not going to do it. And I don't think there's anything that left for me that I want to do, except maybe a one-man show. <laughs> you know, when, I, when I met Cosell, I was thinking about doing a one-man show <laughs> on Cosell because he was, I used to do him in my morning show on WWDC. We'd have Howard Cosell come in and do different things and then to meet him and to have him I would tape my ABC show to New York from WMAL he would tape his right after mine and each morning we would talk back on the two way and I'll never forget when his wife passed away I sent him a card and never met her never met his wife and about a month after she passed away, the phone rings one morning at MAL, and one of the interns says, is a Mr. Cosell wants to speak wow. to you. He says, hello, Johnny, how are you? I said, I'm good, Howard, how are you? I got your card. You never knew Emmy, did you? I said, no. She was the love of my life. She was my total existence. And you took time to send her a card and never knew her. I said, well, I thought it was the proper thing to do. Thank you, my friend.
Boom. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people had Cosell moments. That wasn't like the other moments I heard about right. when oh, no. Howard went after it with mm-hmm. you know someone that wasn't doing. Well, he, every time every time he would come down here, I'd see him at an event. How's Andy Ocker's housing? <laughs> Running that station into the ground. <laughs> WMAL. How does this man keep his job? Every single time. <laughs> so at the muscular dystrophy NFL Players Association banquet, he's the guest speaker and I'm the MC. And I said, I'm going to introduce you as you. Go ahead if you want to make a total peep of yourself. Go ahead. <laughs> so I introduce him. He comes up and he's got his cigar. And he says, I'd like to thank the diminutive one <laughs> for that less than stellar introduction. <laughs> then he looks out in the audience and he says, Huh, there's number 29, Marcus Murphy from the Redskins, defensive back, who moments ago made a move for my wife, Emmy, at the cocktail party (laughs) until I suddenly appeared from the shadows, flashing these fists of steel (laughs) at number 29, (laughs) wisely backed away. (laughs) He had the people just going nuts. Nicest man in the world. What a voice, yeah. Yeah. Johnny, I I don't know how even to close this show because I don't want it to stop. Because, you know, this is the kind of thing that the children of the world, and I like to think I'm still a little bit of a kid, would just like to to learn from, you know. And there's a lot to learn. And there's a lot to to love about what you've done and and how you've done it. Because it's not just the fact you've checked every box there was a hundred times in sports and sports announcing and music and theater performance and singing with the Navy band. And you've checked it with class. And that is not something that's given that's something that's earned and proven and you've done that through all the years we love you oh this has been fun godspeed this has been fun thanks johnny thank you very much for allowing me to uh tell a lot of stories there's a lot more (laughs) how about chapter three huh (laughs) as i said before the show we're going to fact check you after the show because i can't believe all this is true Johnny, take care of yourself. Thanks so much. Thank you. Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Pinecrest. Pinecrest. Go Panthers. Panthers, okay. Go Panthers. There you go. (laughs) Don't miss future episodes by following us on Apple, Spotify, or other podcast platforms. Or go to the YouTube channel where you can subscribe for free.